welcome to The Third Chair, a show about real people, real stories, real life. And here are your hosts for The Third Chair, Peter Grigg and Doug Bozeski. Wow, that was a first great session with Chris Pascarella, a um, previous New York City policeman and author. Um, he's published uh, six books. He's working on a film. And we're going to have him back tonight to ask more questions. Uh, what did you think was the most interesting part of the, the first episode he did with us? I think uh, learning uh, his process and writing a book, I, I liked the part where he said he has to listen to the characters because the characters tell the story. If he doesn't listen, he's going to write, keep writing and go in the wrong direction. So he has mm -hmm. to go back to where mm -hmm. he didn't listen to the character. That is fascinating. We're going to mm -hmm. learn more of his secrets and tips and all about him on tonight's New Year's episode. Welcome back to the third chair with our guest, Chris. I'm Peter. This is Doug. We hope you all had a nice Christmas. Thank you, Chris, for uh, being back with us. And we uh, last, uh, well, let me uh, just mention this. Um, the first episode, we talked a lot about the books you've written and um, some general things about being an author and, and projects. And we're going to uh, continue the discussion on some of the other projects you might be working on. And, and I guess my, my first question is, like, do you... Like, use any special app or technology to, like, track what you're doing with your different projects? Or what do you do besides a, a pad and pen? That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not doing any of these uh, kinds of things where... Uh, are, are you I'm at a... a quirky thing. What's that? I use a different pen for every project. A different, a different color ink or just a different no. pen? Always, always black ink, just a different pen for each project. And it has to stay with that book the whole time until it runs out. Oh, wow. wow. So would you, say, <laughs> would you say then as an author that you have rituals or some degree of superstition? Um, I don't know. Maybe the pen thing is a superstition. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been working so far. <laughs> I like <laughs> and are you no, working? I, Sorry? And I, I, I am a pantser all the way. I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. And yeah. Well, the, the, that's the, when I get to it. The, the first... The first time you used that term, I thought you were talking about, oh, w w does he have some connection like with a German panzer division or something? And it's like a panzer, yeah. Yeah, I love it. The, Are you working on any other kinds of projects? So you, you've talked about uh, books, uh, you've written six, uh, and, that, and then you have uh, screenwriting and film that you're working on. Any other projects going on? Well, book I'm currently working on, um, I'm focused on the heavyweight boxing champion of the world who's about to retire and is fighting his last fight. Oh. And as I go through wow. the round, he thinks about different aspects of his life that got him to this point. W were there so that's one right now. That's my one that's got all my attention right now. Mm. I'm working on a sci fi series. Is uh is and, the boxer one because of any like boxers in the New York area or uh, any of the history? I mean, because uh, New York has a, a long time history. You know, Madison Square Garden and well, uh, and the bouts. The, the championship fight takes place in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a sports fan, big sports fan. Not so much a boxing fan. My older brother is a is a big boxing fan, but I've often wondered. Okay, as I've watched fights, what's going through their head? What are they thinking about? Now, if I have a guy who's been a longtime popular champion, now he's fighting his last fight. What do you reflect on during that fight? You know that your career is coming to an end. Round one, I got 10 more. I got, I'm round five, I got six more rounds and I'm done. What do you start thinking about? And I put it together and he just reflects on his life. How his life might not have been so great, but he was. He did get to be champion of the world. 
Yeah, you, you wonder if um, if a fighter in that situation might be thinking, geez, this young up and coming whippersnapper is trying to kill me. <laughs> and oh, just, you know, can I just survive? <laughs> I have some of that in there where he, he addresses them in his mind. You know, like, you're not backing down. You're not scared of me at all, are you? <laughs> yeah, I have some of that in there. Oh, wow. That's uh, fantastic. And so that uh, sounds like a full plate. Do you do you do the, um, the these projects full time? Is this like a, a, a sort of an eight hour a day thing or what? Uh, I know you, you do some other work. Um, I don't sit and work straight at eight hours um, when the creativity strikes me. You know, what? what's good about having, the reason I have multi-projects going is because I hit a sticking point sometimes. Mm, mm. I for a little while, uh, let this simmer. Well, you know, I, until they're ready to resume, let's go to another one. You know, I would have to think that if you're working a shift somewhere where you're serving a meal or a drink, um, and interacting with um, customers, that's got to be a great source of ideas and material. What I find that helps a lot is standing and listening to conversations. Ah. And you get the pacing of dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm able to translate that. The pacing of the dialogue, I think, is important in the story. Uh -huh. And I'm able to, to draw on that a lot. I hear a lot of different conversations going on. And, Say, okay, I like that. Or somebody reacting the same way to something, or you catch people saying the same phrase over and over again, you throw that into a character. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, now it's a little tough to, uh, in the book, to um, have someone with, like, a New York accent or a uh, Long Island, but I guess you could I, do it somehow. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm done with this. Uh, no, you're going to do the police. Well, I'm actually oh, going to go right with text. The story I'm writing. What's that about the detective story? Uh, I'm kind of incorporating that, that New York attitude. I have a detective who kind of has no filter. Ah. He says he feels like saying uh -huh. less than correct let's say <laughs> now yeah you know, you're a new york policeman is that just stereotype that's hyped up by the media or did you find that yeah some of the new york cops uh were kind of that way you know not just new york cops new york lawyers uh even you know, people i i think it's a it's a product of being more in the city because there's just so many people if you don't start pushing your way through you're never going to get anywhere <laughs> and I think that's that's how that comes about. Yeah. You know, one thing I discovered when I went to New York City, I've only been there a couple of times. If you ask them for directions, they love to tell you directions. <laughs> so, oh, man. So, I... so that they come up, they're all grumpy, and you say, I, how do you find uh, Madison Square Garden, for example? And they'll go, D turn right there, right there, right there. <laughs> Uh, they're all yeah. happy. <laughs> oh man, I was I was in New York uh, driving, and I don't remember if it was. I think it was driving in Manhattan, oh, and wow. it was like an experience that scared the living daylights out of me. I mean, I had the U.S. postal guy like cutting me off and honking at me and shaking his fist. It's like you know, speed up or get off the road, and and I wasn't well, going yeah. slow. <laughs> I was walking in Manhattan, and I said, "I'll never drive in Manhattan." What was that, Chris? There's a thousand cars. Where are you gonna go? People deep in the horn. Where are you gonna go? An ambulance can't get through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that's so we funny. We were walking in New York, and uh, we finally figured out. We were just like everybody else. We learned how to jaywalk, you know. Yeah. Oh man. But so it's so easier to walk because everything's numbered. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you gotta go to Second Street and you're on Twenty Third, and if you walk. The 21st, you went the wrong way. I'm wrong going the other way. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you pay attention, you know within one block that you're going the wrong way. Yeah, it, it, yeah. that's nice compared to the way some cities are laid out. So let me ask you about um, policing. You were in the New York Police Department, New York City Police Department, or a yes. different... Do, do they cover... How big an area does New York City Police Department cover? Mm -hmm. Well, New York City is five boroughs. I was in Brooklyn. Bro actually, Brooklyn, it, the police department is broken up into two, Brooklyn North and Brooklyn South. Oh, wow. I was a Brooklyn North officer. Wow. Um, Brooklyn North are the best cops. with the busiest cops in the state. And, and, and you did that for eight or ten years? Uh, about, yeah, a little over 
little over seven years, yeah. Okay. I got injured. Oh, sorry. And uh, the um, you uh, told me, uh, what, is it conditions? Is that the the, the sort of the, your main duty? Conditions unit. I was in a conditions unit where you addressed the crime condition of the month, whatever the most complaints are, whatever the most calls are being answered, the conditions unit addresses that for the following month to try to bring those numbers down. Oh, wow. You know, we did things like um, delis selling alcohol to underage patrons. Um, we had a condition in a bar where someone was stealing women's pocketbooks. Uh. Uh, we have a prostitution condition we addressed. Things like that. Do we involved with gangs as well, uh, dealing with gang no, issues? There's a separate gangs unit. They deal with all that. You know, if you do come across it, you refer it to them. Now, now, would would if there was a problem with escalating violence, for instance, say there just was more shootouts for whatever reason, would would that make it to your department, or uh, would that no. be a different one? Should, we're more of um, lifestyle conditions, addressing quality of life conditions, quality of life crimes, things like that. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, did but drugs... If we, find that we get a lot of, if we find we're getting a lot of calls of this group of kids hanging out in the park every night, they got loud music going on, let's we'll start hanging out in the park a little bit more. Uh, gotcha. You know, a lot of kids too, that's a lot of community policing. You got kids hanging out in the park for a reason. They have nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, Let's, alley. There's no movie theater. Where are they going to go? Let's uh, hold that thought, Chris. I, I, I want to talk about that because I know you've worked with uh, youth, uh, and we'll talk more about the conditions unit uh, working with youth when we come right back. Welcome back to The Third Chair. I'm Peter. This is Doug, and we're here with our guest, Chris, uh, coming uh, to us uh, live from Long Island. And where we left off, uh, Chris was telling us that he had been a, a New York um, uh, a policeman working the conditions unit, and sometimes that would uh, involve working with kids gathering together, making noise. And so one question that comes up a lot is people throw out the term community policing. And mm -hmm. I've, I've never really had a clear definition of that. What, in your mind, how would you define what uh, a community policing is, say, different than regular policing? Or well, NYPD actually has a community policing division. And what they try to do is... is be a liaison to the community. They'll go to the school board meetings. They go to the meetings at the tenement houses. They organize events for kids in the neighborhood. They're trying to, to build a goodwill. You know, to me also that extends to, I think a big mistake sometimes we make that the police departments across the country make is changing the sectors that people work. I think being a part of the community policing is being a part of the community itself. They should know who the cop is every day patrolling their neighborhood. It should be the same person every single day. Then you get to know who they are. 
They know who you are. And when something happens, you know the players already. You'll, you'll know, okay, that's not a bad kid. He's, he's here for us. He's here to help us. He's not a bad kid. Don't worry about him. But mm-hmm. when you keep changing up and there's a different cop every day or, or the same cop only gets that beat twice or three times a week, you don't build that. They don't know your name. They don't know your name on the street. The, the neighborhood you're policing, they should know your name. They should know who you are. And I think we got kind of away from a lot of that. And I think a lot of that is cops don't get out of the car enough. Yeah. Uh, get yeah. Out of the, off the neighborhood. I saw um, a video on YouTube where um, a cop was responding to a noise complaint and it was a couple of older teenagers boxing in the street. And the cop pulled over, he gets out, and he'd actually been a a boxing champion in college. And he says, give me the gloves. And there's this YouTube of him boxing this uh, just kid from the neighborhood. And it was like amazing. And I was thinking, you know, that's like community policing, doing something like that. Um, yeah, that's a... Oh, what's that? I had like that. We, we had a complaint of kids in a schoolyard. Mm-hmm. And the school dogs lit up at night. They were playing stickball. There was like six kids. They were playing stickball. Yeah, were they a little loud? Sure, because the buildings are on top of everything. Mm-hmm. But my thing was, instead, listen, guys, the neighbors are complaining a little bit. Can you keep it down? Oh, we're playing the game. Okay, how about this? If you strike me out... You can keep playing. If I get a hit off of you, you got you got to go home. You got to stop now. People are complaining. I thought I was going to get struck out. I saw the first two pitches from this kid. I was like, uh-oh. I ended up hitting the ball. And then it, but then it grew into, oh, come on, let's keep playing. Oh, come on. Let's, now, I know these kids now. Now, the next time they're playing, I'm like, officer, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. You know, now I know them. Now, if something happens to me, they're more likely to make a phone call to get me help if I need it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, then we'll like, you know, we play ball here. These guys over there, I don't know who they are. They're doing something wrong. They're more likely to come to you and tell you that because, what, because I swung a baseball bat with them for, for 10 minutes? Well, yeah, absolutely. That goes a long way. Why do you, you mention you, you, you thought that perhaps at times cops stayed in the car too much? Is this well, is that what they're being taught to do, like at the academy or by their peers, or is it just uh, more of a feeling of safety or what? What what do you think's going on with that? You're not really being taught because we do have you do have things where you get out of the car when you go and check the apartment buildings. You do a vertical patrol. It's called. You can get out and put yourself out as doing a walk and talk, where you walk in the neighborhood. I mean, yes, they want you in the car because it's the quickest way to respond. Right. Something that happened. I was six blocks away. I'm, it's quicker for me to get there. I'm out of the car. Now i got to get back to the car and get there. And they want you to do that. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with you. Go up to the park. Get out of the car. Go, go talk to the ice cream man there. Get yourself a, a, a soda from the ice cream man and talk to the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. I, I like that. I think that that goes a long way. Yeah. It does go a long way. The little things go a long way. There are things that people don't think about. And if the child doesn't have... In the New York City parks, they have sprinklers for the summertime for kids to run around in. Yeah. Innocently, a mother took her daughter's dress off to run through it. That's an innocent thing. The kid was two years old. Right. Called the mother up. What are you doing? She goes, why, you're not allowed to do that? I said, no, I want the kid to have a good time. But you don't know in the park who's taking pictures of your little girl without a dress on. You got to think about these things. Right. I didn't think about that. Thank you so much. I get paid to think about that. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I kept that kid from showing up on some internet site. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. For sure. I hope, I hope the mother thought twice about ever doing that again. Yeah, you know, it's an unfortunate thing we have to think on those terms, but it happens. Oh, yeah. You, uh, when we when we talked the other night, uh, I'd asked you about if there was ever a time you had to arrest somebody that you really didn't want to. And sort of the the feelings and the thoughts with that. Tell us tell us that story. I know you know the one I'm talking about. I, I, I had a kid that uh, I was trying to see him go the, the right way. He was hanging out with the wrong crowd. He never really got in trouble, but he was around trouble too much. And he finally took that step. That he, he was the guy who caused the trouble. He was doing robberies. And the detective who looking for him, I said, I can find this guy. I had this guy for 10 minutes. I honestly thought, once I found him, because I knew where he'd be, he'd come along quietly. He surprised me completely. Took off running, went hiding under in the basement of a building. We had a big grid search looking for this kid. 
I was like, really? All the times I tried to help you and steer you in the right direction. And, you know, if you had come in, I, I could have vouched for you. I could have stood up for you and been like, you know what? He's not really a bad kid. He just did the stupid thing. After he made that move, I, he tied my hands. Yeah. 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 Try to help. It breaks your heart when you can't. Mm-hmm. You know, see somebody who, who's smarter than that. You know, you, you, you know what you're doing is wrong. And you took that path anyway. Why? To fit in with a couple of knuckleheads? Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah it breaks when that happens. Did um did in your career did you ever have were you ever shot at or did you ever have to shoot at anybody? No. No, thank God. That gun only got fired at the range for practice. Nice. I had it out a couple of times, but never got to that point. Wow. Yeah, I mean I think that's great. I mean I you know, um sometimes I think it's just uh you, you know, you know, it makes you wonder. You know, when when you hear police shootings, are people being too aggressive, or are they just having an unlucky day where it happened to be a bad criminal where there's going to be shooting, or is that a sign of somebody who doesn't perhaps um, know de-escalation skills well enough? Probably a mixture you know, of all three. It, it comes down to you have less than a second to make a decision that can either cost you your life. Or you're going to be safe. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, in the, in the dark, in the dim light, a CD, a cell phone, keys, a flashlight, they don't look like what they are. And yep. can you take that second to say, what is that? But at the same time, you take that second to pause, maybe the next thing you hear is your head hitting the ground because you just got shot in the chest. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, Malcolm Gladwell in one of his people books. People quick to judge who've never been there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Malcolm Gladwell in one of his books said a vast majority of cops never shoot a gun in their whole career. Yes, that's uh, true. Yeah, other than the range. Yeah. yeah well, unfortunately, the, the shootings get the sensational news right. and it doesn't oh, yeah. recommend, it doesn't recognize what goes on the most. Bad, bad news sells, but, you know, nobody hears about the, the, the cop who, uh, bought milk for the lady in his patrol area because she didn't know she can't afford it. Yeah, you boy. Know? What uh, what uh, made you want to join the police force? Um, always always had it in my head. Um, was talked out of it several times by parents and other influential people in my life. You know, do you really want to do that? It's dangerous. 9-11 happened. Then 9-11 happened. And no, I, I need to serve. I need to serve. I wasn't going into the service. I was 33 years old at the time. Yeah, I, I wasn't going into the service, but I could do this. Nice. Nice. And, well, and you then, know, we're going to um, stop right there. When we come back, I'm going to ask you a question about advice you got from a wise senior police officer th- that you should consider when you start your job. And we will hit that when we come back. Hi, this is Peter Gregg on the set of The Third Chair. Our company, Two Men and a Duck Entertainment, are excited about supporting Quantum Leap Recovery, an audio podcast that talks about all issues about drug and alcohol recovery. So watch for it and listen to it, and it'll be a a great time of uh, learning, and uh, hopefully it'll help people that are uh, struggling with these issues um, uh, have a healthier life. Thank you very much. Welcome back to The Third Chair. I'm Peter. This is Doug, and we are here again with uh, Chris from Long Island, who's telling us about some of his duties as a New York police officer. And uh, the other night, he told me some fascinating advice that a senior officer told him. And Chris, uh, what was that advice? Well, when I first got out of the academy, I was fortunate to ride with someone who was a 15-year veteran. And the very first thing he told me is when we go to a call, 
It's the person's worst time in their life. They're not calling you over to have dinner. Do not make the situation worse by having an attitude. You're there to listen. You're there to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he told me why. He said, think about this. The police officer is second to God. Because when something happens, people say, oh, my God, call the police. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it worse. It's, or, it's already a bad day for them. Nobody calls the cops for having a good time. It's, it's something bad is happening. That, I think that's wise advice. Or the way you carry yourself, listen. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, I like that. Don't, um, don't escalate a situation, especially when you have the power to escalate a situation. <laughs> where are you, if you start out up here, where are you going from there? Yeah. There's no way to go. Keep, right. it, keep it low as long as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy, that's great advice. Final question about your policing, and, and then we'll move on to a different area. Uh, what would you say, oh, actually two questions. First of all, I, I you, you had told me that you had a back injury from working as a police officer. Um, I, I, so I'm interested sort of um, uh, if you're willing to share like what happened and, and are, are serious back injuries like this uh, really common in police work? I mean, I, I assume there's some injuries, of course. And it's, there are injuries. I mean, it's the nature of the job, you know. You're going to run into people who don't want to go to jail. <laughs> yeah. Are threatened when you come upon them, and things happen. In this instance, we had a call for um, a burglary in progress. It wasn't a burglary. It was a disoriented woman who went into the wrong apartment building and was trying to get in the door. She thought she was home. I was the backup on it. There were two officers already on the job. I was coming up the stairs and they had kind of went to steer her and she flipped out and she threw a kick out that caught me in the chest and I just kept going. Oh, so she kicked you down the stairs. (laughs) Oh my goodness. You just have to land the wrong way when that happens. Oh, oh, it was not not pleasant. Mm -hmm. And And so you had to have surgery and... (laughs) By the belt to put me on the board. I was like, my back, what are you doing? Oh my goodness. They thought I was shot. They thought I was shot when the EMT got there. They started ripping off my clothes and stuff. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did they, as, a, as an officer shot, I didn't get shot. Yeah. And some little girl kicked me down the stairs, basically beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I bet you didn't uh, live that down that, for that story. But um, it, it turned out to be a big deal. You had some back surgery, and and yeah, ultimately you, you couldn't carry on as a policeman? You know, it could always be worse. I look at every situation that way. Somebody, somebody's always got it worse than you do. Yeah, that's that's a good way of looking at it. That's the silver lining, and yet that's still some pain and suffering you went through uh, for and, and serving. If, if I didn't get hurt and wasn't forced to retire, maybe I'm not writing books right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. I, I was, uh, absolutely. Cool. Lots of. It seems like uh, despite that hard time, there have still been a lot of good things that have happened to you. Well, you know, you don't recognize the good times without having hard times in your life. Yeah. You know, you, you don't know up without having it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, one last question about your police career. What um, what accomplishment or time uh, in the police force were you the most proud of looking over your years of service? Um, <laughs> I did it. One kid who was trying to do the right thing, he, he wanted out of the neighborhood in the worst way, and there was no way he was going away to college. And I told him, join the military. Give two years of service, and it'll change your life. Two years later, he found me. It changed his life. Wow. He said, yeah, right. Because I don't talk to those knuckleheads anymore. I know how to get myself out of situations. I know how to act in certain books because I've learned that through that. And that was great. I, you know, I feel like, yeah, I got to change that kid's life. It was great. Fantastic. Yeah, the military does that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dick. Um, I understand you like to uh, cook. Oh, I love it. So, so what kind of food do you like to cook? Well, uh, specialties. They like my meatballs. They like lasagna. 
if Christmas time comes and I don't do chicken parmesan, I may get attacked by the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm. so, so, so when you come, if, if I come to New York and I come to your house, Brooklyn? Absolutely. There'll be room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this food sounds good. Always have a chair to pull up. So, so, so you're Italian. Is that why it leads to this Italian cooking or... Yes. Well, it also seems to be what everybody likes the most. I mean, we got the best food, right? Oh, that's true. Uh -huh, yeah. I know. I'm, I'll do a roast beef. I like the slow cooker. I like to do ribs. I like the barbecue. Mm. Like All that sounds good. We have family dinner every Sunday, which I think is very important. You know, my, my girls, it's the one time a week we get to be together. My niece comes, my, my girls are here. It's nice. It's nice to be together at one time a week. Yeah, you know, that's uh, Enjoy cooking for them, so let's do it. That's kind of a lost tradition. So everybody goes home with leftovers, you know. Yeah, that is. Yeah. But, but it, it's a great tradition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Sunday dinner. You Sunday know, dinner. People over. Mm -hmm. We need that. I think we need more of that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. More Sunday dinner. More everyday dinners. Mm -hmm. More people gathering, gathering as a family. <laughs> right. Now there's a question. If I find out someone's from New York, I always ask them. It's a very important question. Mets or Yankees? I I am a Yankee fan because when I was ten years old, Chris Chambliss hit that home run that sent them to the World Series, and that was it. I was hooked. Oh, I However, remember that home run. I, and will not root against the Mets unless they are playing the Yankees. They're they're a New York team. I want them to do well too. So so who's your favorite Yankee of all time? Oh, I I go Greg Nettles. I oh, you know Greg Nettles? Yeah, I don't call for the big name. You know, Greg Nettles was that third baseman during the, this run in the 70s when they won a couple of World Series. And, oh, man, it was great. I love him. You know, Greg Nettles came up. I'm a Minnesota Twins fan. You know, Greg Nettles came up with the Twins. Yes. And they they hardly played them one year, and then they traded them to the Indians. And I'm like, I look back yeah. at that trade, and I said, oh. <laughs> Not so good. Not so good. <laughs> so I like a good defensive game. I like a one nothing, two one baseball game. Oh, is that right? And I play matters, and that guy just came up big in the biggest spots all the time. Oh yeah, I remember that World Series when he he feel like four or five plays and saved. Oh the yeah, game. I think. I think Steve Garvey still has nightmares about that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> You know, sometimes a good defensive game. I remember a friend of mine went to see the Padres play in San Diego, and they're playing the Giants. The game was two to one, but so many great plays happened that game. We just talked about it, still talk about it, and it's like uh, it seems like when, when there's a when there's a no hitter, there's always four or five plays that should have been hit. That guy's got Rob on. It's just great. Block. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like. Well, he wouldn't have had a no hitter if it wasn't for the shortstop who did this or <coughs> something like that. And uh, I understand you're a big fan of John Wayne. Ah, oh, I love John Wayne. My father got me watching old movies when I was a little kid, and yeah, John Wayne's the man. First movie I liked was The Cowboys, but then he dies in that movie, and I don't like that so much. <laughs> yeah, he dies in a lot of his movies. Yeah, he does. Yeah, 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 the the yeah, the Sands of Iwo Jima movie. He dies. Um, oh yeah, we watched that together. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, the, yeah. The Duke dies in a bunch of his movies. I think the shoot us, he dies. That's mm -hmm. one of his last, or one of his last mm -hmm. ones. Uh, okay, well, think about this over the break. What is your favorite John Wayne movie? Uh, easy one. <laughs> well, I guess you don't have to think much, but we're taking a break anyway. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a break anyways, and, and you can answer that when we come right back. <laughs> right. We sure hope you're enjoying this episode of The Third Chair. Would you like to be a sponsor for The Third Chair? We would love to have you join us to keep the show going and also help your business. Send us an email about your product or company, and let's talk. And follow us on social media. Now back to the third chair. Yes. Welcome back to the third chair with Chris. And uh, he's going to tell us what his favorite John Wayne movie is. The Quiet Man. Oh, I love that movie. 
It's one of my favorites. You haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, not. He's a John Wayne fan. This is. How do you not? You know. I was. You know, and I like boxing too. Is was India a boxer in that movie? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it takes place in Ireland. Yeah, he's going back to, to his is family it? roots to live quiet retirement. That appeals to everybody. Well, does he does, does, retirement does, does he pretend to have an Irish accent in the movie? No. Okay, no. so he doesn't do. He's American. I mean, he's American. And he's going back. American boxer going to Ireland. Quiet. And his family. There's so many good lines in that. There's things oh, they yeah. say in that movie they can never get away with today. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> but I love that movie. Yes. And, uh, it just has know, so, so many good lines, great characters. It's just it's, it's very entertaining. I enjoy it so much. Uh, you've convinced me. i got to watch it. It, it is surprising that a lot of women love that movie. That's uh, probably the... Oh, God. That, if it's a chick flick. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those chick flicks. Uh, Don't mean, a chick flick. It, it's a, a comedy. <laughs> there's uh, action. and uh, Yeah. It, it is... Uh, is it better than Sleepless in Seattle? Oh, <laughs> don't get me going on that one. <laughs> There's so much stuff that you laugh at in that movie. It's just wow. Oh yeah, there is. <laughs> but you say it's a tad politically incorrect. The um, oh, the current culture would not be as excited about it. There's a woman picks up a stick and gives it to him. Says here's a, here's a stick to beat the lovely last with. <laughs> oh jeez yeah that wouldn't fly <laughs> oh. Yeah, oh, man. she has to stick to John Wayne <laughs> oh wow Maureen O'Hara is uh, the love interest in the movie crazy they're good together very good together oh yeah that that, that movie is uh, really good mm -hmm. I just have to drive you guys but uh, I'll come on I'll even bring chicken <laughs> I love chicken. <laughs> How do you miss it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, speaking of, where would you love to travel, and uh, why? Um, I would like to take the time to go on a European tour and start in England, work my way down through Italy, come up around the Mediterranean into Greece. Mm. Well, I want to see my my roots. I want to see where my family originated in, in Naples. Um, England always appeals to me because I, I like medieval history. I like the whole idea of castles and things. Mm -hmm. And well, you see plenty of castles. Just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of those in Germany too. Oh uh, yeah, the castles all over Europe actually. Okay. They have them in Ireland and, uh, and my brother-in-law he. My, sister, my wife told me, yeah, she went on a trip and, with the family and my brother-in-law. And he says, to England, and he said, uh, are we going to see another bloody castle again today? <laughs> he was just castled out. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to see one of Shakespeare's plays at the Globe, actually. Oh, wow. I'll, I'll do that. My, my daughter took a class, and she actually did that. That's great. I know. That's I great. am envious of her. <laughs> That's great. And then uh, you said you listen to country music, but you do a little rock and roll because you said you like Elvis. Oh, Elvis is the man. I had an argument with somebody like, how can you like Elvis? He never wrote any of his own songs. Yeah, he didn't have to, buddy. <laughs> he, 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 he made the sounds his own, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, um, yeah he, he, he was a pioneer still. The, the the voice is just amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And he sort of I mean, got started in gospel. It was sort of a, that, one of his early. Uh, well, he went. You know what happened? He was Sam Phillips was looking for someone, and Elvis came in, and at that time you could make a record. So he he was making a gospel record for his mother to give her her Mother's Day or her birthday or something. Oh wow! And they they heard him, and they said, "Come back and do." <laughs> And then they, that's where they turned him, and then he recorded gospel, uh, mm. you know, in his career. But he was, he started off as rock and roll. Well, I, I, I remember Elvis on the, uh, uh, the Ed Sullivan show where he sang Hound Dog, and they actually brought out a hound dog, and he was pointing his finger at the hound dog while he sang the song. <laughs> like, crazy, come on. Yeah. 
Well, mm-hmm. Elvis's Grammys all won on as gospel. He never yeah, won a true. Grammy other than in gospel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And ha- have you ever visited Graceland? No. No, oh, I visited Graceland and they have his Grammy and they tell that story. Yeah. I got to do that. My mother's done that. So my mother was my mother was a big Elvis fan, and I grew up listening to her. She had it playing in the house all the time. And my mother was a big job. Another singer you mentioned when we talked to you before that you like is Johnny Cash. I mean, I heard Johnny Cash all the oh, time yeah. when I was a kid. Johnny Cash is great. My brother thought he was a cowboy for a time, and he's older than I am, so that's the music he was playing like in our room. Ah! <laughs> and I, I loved it. Johnny Cash, his voice is so distinctive, you know, and it's just, that's why I love it. It's different than everybody else. That's what appeals to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I had read one of his biographies and he said uh, his mom saved money and got him music lessons. And the teacher said after one lesson, she said, you know, I'm not going to teach you anymore. Just one thing to remember, don't let anybody screw with your voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that can be good advice. Yeah, because <clears throat> she, says, she says you got a unique voice. Don't let it uh, just keep it up. <laughs> Absolutely, that's the same as any artist, right? If you got a unique thing going on, don't try to fit into everybody right. else's. Do your thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. you'll find the audience. Yeah, because uh, if they sound all sound alike, you know why would should I buy your record? You sound yeah. like somebody else. I can yeah, buy absolutely. their record. Yeah, that, and, and that's a challenge, I think, for an artist because people will say, well, I know if you sound like X, that that person makes money, so I want you to sound like that person because you'll you'll make money and, rather than letting you um, truly be unique. Yeah, but you're not them. You don't have the personality. You don't yeah, have that. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting because I read Sam Perkins discovered Johnny Cash and Elvis and, like, Roy Orbison and... Carl Perkins and all those. And he said, the only thing I looked for is if it sounded good and if they were unique. That mm, was what he yeah. was looking for. Yeah, and sure. It, you, need some, right? you need a hook. You yeah. Know? And that, that was the thing. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, he started from scratch and he he grew big, you know, eventually. But it's like mm-hmm. nowadays, I don't know, sometimes they, they don't want unique out there. Yeah. It's, so the... Because Johnny Cash and Elvis, I mean, Elvis is more fast, usually, except for a few songs. And then Johnny Cash is more slow and somber. Uh, do, do you have, are you in different moods when you pick who to listen to? or? Um. Yeah, you know what? I, I get hooked on a song sometimes. You know, like, I'll hear a song, oh, I like that. Uh, I listen to it again and again, and then it just plays into, let the album play. Just let it play. Uh-huh. And I'll let it play for a while. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think mood. I think it's more like uh, that song's catchy. I like it. Let's see what else he's got. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, but I like all the icons. You know, I went from I went from Elvis to I'm a big Beatles fan. I oh, like the Who. Beatles. <laughs> yeah, I like all the icons. And you like the the Who as well. Oh, the Who's great, greatest band of all time. I don't care what they say. The Beatles are good, but the Who was great. <laughs> <laughs> Were you like a Led Zeppelin fan as well? No. No, no, not at all. Really? Because uh, yeah, uh, I did. It's uh, it wasn't just that they were British. Um, you just didn't like that style of music as much. I, 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 you know, the the whole thing is with their albums. They're you know, Pete Townsend's a storyteller. Yeah. You know, one song weaves into the next. It's a continuous story. Mm. You know, Tommy's a continuous story. Quadrophenia yeah. is a continuous story. Yeah, yeah. That, that that appealed to me, and I guess because I'm a storyteller. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, are you a fan of Elton John? Oh yes. Oh, he tells stories. Yeah, he tells stories too. Yeah. 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 I saw. Elton and he doesn't write his own songs. Bernie Taupin does. <laughs> no, no, he writes. He writes, he writes, writes the, the music. music. Yeah. He writes the music. Yeah. I mean, they have a arrangement. In yeah, the, and they have since the seventies. I know. Yeah. I mean, that is some arrangement. I mean, mm-hmm. to do it like that. So. Uh, Whatever when works. we come back, works. we'll have our last segment, and you can remind the audience of how they can contact you, and we'll talk about a few other things. All right, we'll come right back.
I can't believe that we've hit 40 episodes. Yes. I knew it because I knew it was a number between 39 and 41. <laughs> Ah, yeah, you auditors, you're always the same. Yeah, that's quite a, an exciting uh, achievement for the company. We've been putting one up a week since, I guess, around March. And, and now we've even expanded. We got two episodes, two guests on location, and then we talked to a lady in Los Angeles live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. The, uh, the kinds of places we went, Twin Lakes where we did the uh, Amy and Colorado Tight Flies episode. And she did fly fishing. I mean, we she filmed did, yeah, that. I ran for cover. And we managed to get that episode in, like, right before a major storm hit. It was amazing. And we went to a barber shop, and you ran for cover again when the scissors came out? <laughs> I ran for cover, yeah. Or you either ran to that or the gum yeah, machine. Yeah, you know? I couldn't believe I couldn't get a gumball then, right? But yeah, that well, was uh, just a, a riot uh, filming on location, but a little extra work carrying the equipment mm -hmm. around. A little extra work, but I think it's worth it. I think so, too. All, all the three of those episodes are great. I think that um, that's one of the things for the future. We're very excited about uh, contacting people that may be out of town or in town that work at an interesting location that wouldn't be mine filmed on location, as long as you have a story to tell. And everybody has a story to tell. I think you're so mm -hmm. right. So... Uh, please uh, follow us on social media, and let's get back to our episode. Welcome back to the third chair. This is Peter, that is Doug, and we're here with Chris. And I am curious, uh, do you have kids? I do. I have two girls. What's the hardest part of being a father for you? Having two girls. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, um, are, are, uh, are, do they have you like wrapped around your finger, their finger? Um, you know what? They're always uh, my girls are now twenty six and twenty two, but they're always daddy's little girl, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I have three daughters. I know that feeling. Um, boy, yeah. So, uh, were uh, were you the disciplinarian, or was your wife? Um. Probably, I would say more my wife than me, but <laughs> yeah. I think any of us were soft, you know, and yeah. now that I see where they are in their lives, we've done great. I think we did a great job. Fantastic. You know? I, I, my, older daughter, my, my younger daughter was away in school. She's lived away from home. And um, I asked her, what are you planning to do when you graduate? She goes, well, I don't want to move back home. And she's like, I'm not saying that to hurt your feelings. I said, you're not hurting my feelings. You're telling me that I've raised you to be self-sufficient. You just yeah. told me I did my job. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. And then one of your daughters is in law school. That my, uh, old, my older daughter is. She owns a home. Yeah. She has a job and she goes to law school. Wow, that's one wow. Kid. <laughs> that's impressive. Uh, I imagine that potentially makes for some interesting legal discussions. Um, we try to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mary, that's a wise man. Yeah. You know, it's a whole different viewpoint. Like right now she's, she was talking about, um, she had to write a cross examination and I can relate to that because I've been, you know, you get asked weird questions. I, I had stopped the guy, stole a person in the train station and I stopped him. And my question I got on, on the stand was, well, why'd you stop him? So, well, a man carrying a purse. What, a man can't carry a purse? And my response was, it didn't match his shoes. Because <laughs> <laughs> was like, ask the question, he gave you a valid reason. And sometimes she's like, Dad, are these valid reasons that this guy's saying these things and what she had to write? I'm like, yeah, if you can, if that's what led you to the next step, yeah, it's a valid reason. Yeah, so that's... that's the we have, but nothing like, uh, the opinion of the law or anything like that. Sure. You know, my, my daughter's boyfriend, my my soon-to-be son-in-law, he's a court officer, so she's on on kind of our side a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you uh you you talked about the idea of empty chairs like uh, at the kitchen table at church at events? What's your thoughts on that? Empty chairs are the biggest problem in this country. You have empty chairs at the dining room table where families aren't discussing their day because everybody's in a hurry. 
You have empty seats in church because people just don't want to waste their Sunday. Oh, God, God sacrificed himself on the cross for you. You can give him an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, empty seats at children's events. Your kid's singing in the chorus. It's the biggest moment of his life, and you're not there? Really? Mm -hmm. You know, your kid got a little certificate for perfect attendance. And, yeah, it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but it is to him. You're not there? How do you think he feels when he looks out? Mm -hmm. And he's the only kid whose parents aren't there. Yeah. You know, too, many, too many parents aren't there. I mean, I understand it. But, you know, I do. I get it. You, you got to work so hard for, for so little sometimes. And you do miss out on things. But if we start filling in those empty seats, I think the world changes. Uh, uh, I, I agree totally. Chris, how, how can people get a hold of you? What's the best way? Um, my Facebook author page, author Chris Pasquarella. I will answer any questions you have. I will gladly interact with you. I also have a YouTube channel, Chris Pasquarella on YouTube. You can take a look at the teaser reel for a possible film or TV series we're looking to do based on the books. And of course, find my books on Amazon. You can also follow me on Amazon. Author Chris Pasquarella on Amazon. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, two weeks, Chris. We're so uh, grateful for your time. We've enjoyed talking with you. And, uh, of course, we're going to ask our audience to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. From all of us, uh, good night to you all. Good night, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. This has been The Third Chair. Want to be a guest? Want to sponsor our show? Send us an email. Please subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.